Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Coming up, Speaker of the House designate Melissa Hortman and current Speaker Kurt Doubt weigh in on the coming session. The Walls administration begins leadership appointments and the cost of insulin prompts an informational hearing. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The DFL gained control of the House of Representatives in the last election. House Speaker designate Melissa Hortman joins me in the studio to talk about the House DFL priorities for the 2019 session. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. The DFL picked up 18 seats in the last election. You only needed 11 to gain control. What does this mean to you? Well, having a strong majority allows us to do more work. We have a great team from all across the state of Minnesota. And so we are really ready to get to work for Minnesotans. We have a lot of members of the team who are anxious to get to work. And I noticed uh, with committee assignments, you had some newer lawmakers uh, receive committee assignments, receive the gavel, also more seasoned. What's the thinking behind that strategy? Well, the number of committees that we created was really focused on the work that needs to get done. So for example, we need to have a long-term care committee. That is an increasingly important issue to Minnesota families. We also needed to have a housing committee because there's important work in that area. So looking at the number of areas of work that we needed to do, we created gavels through third term members. So everybody who's third term or higher has a gavel. That's also important because it provides an opportunity for leadership. It gives people a space within which to, to bring proponents and opponents of proposals together and to have conversations and get us ready to do more work. Well, it also prepares people then for future leadership. Uh, there's been some criticism that you know certain people just always have, and the younger people don't get that opportunity. So this maybe opens some doors in that area? Right, we all, I think, need to see a mix in our workplaces of promotion based on seniority and promotion based on merit. There's wisdom that comes from years of service, but there's also a fresh perspective that comes from new people coming from the outside to make a difference. Uh, one other change I noticed, a subcommittee on legislative process reform has been created in the addition to finance committee, committees in energy and climate, housing, greater Minnesota jobs, economic development, and criminal justice reform. So what is the thinking behind some of these changes? So I want to create space to solve problems. Uh, with criminal justice reform, if we just have a one-day committee hearing under the Public Safety Finance Committee, we're not really doing justice to the issue of criminal justice reform. There is substantial work that needs to be done. Same with housing. It was just a one-day hearing in the Jobs Committee, but there's a substantial problem with not having affordable housing throughout the state of Minnesota. If we have a committee that's dedicated to housing, they're looking at that issue throughout the entire legislative session, multiple meetings, lots of conversations, actually maybe traveling with the committee, going out into the committees where there's the biggest uh, lack of affordable housing. So it's a, it's a way of having conversations on topics that haven't gotten enough attention. And the opportunity to garner more expertise among lawmakers in some of these areas that, that are problems facing the state. Well, absolutely. You look at Carlos Mariani, the chair of Public Safety Finance and Criminal Justice Reform, and there really isn't anyone more suited in the legislature for uh, talking to uh, members of racial mi minorities talking to law enforcement how is it that we can look at what's going on in, in the criminal justice area and make some improvements that make people's lives better on both sides of the equation let's uh, turn to this will be a budget year and the forecast came out and there's a budget surplus and in many years uh, people would be talking about tax cuts or they'd be talking about more spending depending on their party affiliation however you spoke of the need for caution why a cautious approach? Well, we took out inflation from the state budget forecast in 2002. So Roger Moe and Tim Pawlenty, both then lawmakers wanting to run for governor, saw on the horizon a very big projected budget deficit. And the only way to make that uh, budget deficit smaller for whichever one of them would win the gubernatorial election, become the governor, was to um, stop taking inflation into account. So when we get our state budget forecast now, it doesn't take into account inflation on the spending side. It takes into account inflation on the revenue side, but not on the spending side. But so there's a little footnote. If you look at the asterisk in the state budget forecast, it lets us know that we can anticipate inflation of 1.1 billion. So we have a real budget surplus of 382 million. That's a very different number than 1.5 billion. Perhaps more significantly, 
when you look out in the next two-year period, the projection is that we would have a $2.5 billion deficit. And currently, we only have $2 billion in our rainy day fund, our budget reserve. So we have to be cautious going forward as the economy starts to move back in the cycle towards uh, our next recession, uh, likely. That's economic cycles just happen. Or at least happen. to slow down. The, right. We have to be prepared. We should not get the state in a situation where it's made a lot of spending commitments that it will not later have the revenue to pay for. What are the most important issues that you believe need to be addressed early in session? Well, uh, we in the DFL House Caucus went all across the state of Minnesota throughout 2017 and 2018, and we asked Minnesotans what their values were, what was important to them. Blank slate. What, what makes you proud of your community? What makes you concerned about your community? And Minnesotans told us that they value really the same things across all geographic divides. They want to be able to take care of their families, and they want their neighbors to have the same opportunity to take care of their families. And what that meant to Minnesotans all across the state was world-class schools, affordable health care, and economic security. So those are Minnesotans' values, and those are our priorities. So anything that's going to further those goals is something you're going to move towards? Absolutely. We know that um, our schools haven't been as fully funded as they were back in the 80s and 90s when we were at, you know, always number one or number two in competition with Massachusetts for the best education in the whole country. In order to get back to that position, we need to invest in our schools. That's one example. How important is conforming the state's tax law to the federal tax law changes? It didn't get done in the last session. How important is it that that get done this session? It's very important, but there's a, there's a difference between urgent in terms of timing and important in terms of we have to get that work done. So it is not urgent that we take up tax conformity in January and February. Our Department of Revenue is all ready for Minnesotans to file their 2018 taxes. Everything is all set. The forms are ready, the department is ready, and they really need six to eight months of lead time before they can change everything so that filers can file easy when we make changes to the tax laws down here at the legislature. So we're all set for the 2019 filing season. We can all file our 2018 taxes. No urgent action is needed. It's important that by the end of the session, we do some tax conformity to account for the very large and unanticipated changes that were made in December of 2017. So that will be a conversation. Uh, one other thing, we've been talking about some big statewide issues and strategy in the House. What are, what's maybe one or two smaller issues like Sunday liquor sales two sessions ago that's percolating that people are talking about but maybe hasn't risen to the top but might there might be some action this session? I would say a change in the sexual harassment laws. You know, we had uh, a state representative resign due to a sexual harassment situation. We had a state senator resign due to a sexual harassment situation. We had special elections. And we talked a lot about sexual harassment in 2017 and 2018. We didn't do anything to change the law. We changed our policy. And our policy now demands that House members behave in a way that uh, measures up to a higher standard that, than what's in the law. Well, shouldn't the law demand more of people? We think maybe the law should be a little stronger in this regard to protect people. Speaker designate Melissa Hortman, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Joining me in the studio to offer his caucus's perspective and objectives for the coming 2019 legislative session is House Speaker Kurt Doubt. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Now that your caucus will hold minority status in the next session, will your goals and objectives change in any major way? You know, for us, they really won't. Uh, what drives our caucus and our goals and our objectives really are the, the problems that are facing Minnesotans. And, and those problems uh, are, are bigger than uh, any one party and, and really are going to take both parties to roll up their sleeves and, and work on solving. So uh, the way we see it, our, our biggest priorities right now are still reducing health care costs for Minnesotans, whether it be um, the actual cost of health care or the cost of health insurance, which we've seen uh, skyrocket uh, under Obamacare, um, or uh, investing more money in roads and bridges. We got a little more than halfway to solving that need uh, over the next 10 years in the last biennium, but uh, there's still more to do to get our road and bridge infrastructure up to par, so that's still something we want to work on. Um, and we still want to make sure that we're uh, being respectful of the, the resources that Minnesotans have given us. It's really because of Minnesotans that we have this 
uh, surplus, this projected surplus right now, and, and the great work that they've done to grow a, a building and, and growing a thriving economy. So, um, and, and it's partly because of the fact that we left more tax dollars in their pockets. Uh, if we raise taxes now, uh, at a time when we have a surplus, uh, we think it could have a negative impact. So um, those are the issues that we'll be working on. And, and as long as Democrats uh, live up to their campaign promises and work on those things, we'll be right there with them. Well, speaking of the surplus, uh, it is projected to be $1.5 billion, but they are also projecting an economic slowdown around 2021. So many people have been talking about taking a cautious approach to the next budget cycle. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think that's not bad advice, and I think we always kind of want to take a little bit of a cautious approach, um, especially when we're talking about forecasts out beyond the next biennium. Um, there's less certainty the further you get out, and, and our economists here in the state and, and the economic data that we rely on to, to create those forecasts is very often uh, pessimistic about economic growth continuing. Um, um, in fact, the, uh, if you look at the, the February forecast uh, from uh, earlier in 2018, um, it called for a $450 million surplus in the next biennium, which is what we're talking about. Now, there's about a $2 billion surplus in the next biennium. About half a billion of that went directly into the reserves, which leaves us with the billion and a half um, that's still there, which we'll get to spend. But if you look at that turnaround, that's a billion and a half dollar turnaround from February to uh, our November forecast. Um, so. Uh, we're seeing great economic growth. I think that the, the growth numbers that they've used in this forecast are still a bit pessimistic, um, and I think things uh, are looking very good for the state. But I think caution is always something that is probably good advice. Now, in terms of your caucus, in recent weeks, four Republican members broke away from your Republican caucus to form their new House Republican caucus. How Will, will this have any impact in the upcoming session? You know, I don't think so. I think if it comes to Democrats voting to raise the cost of health care or uh, voting to raise taxes on Minnesotans at a time when we have a record surplus, I think you're still going to see 59 votes against that. Um, I am, I have to say, disappointed that those members chose to do that. Uh, they didn't visit with me or with any other members of my caucus about uh, any troubles that they were having or, or, or disagreements. and, and uh, unfortunately, I think this is kind of a, uh, an unfortunate situation, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that they'll still be voting with us against uh, raising health care costs and against raising taxes, and um, I think that's what Minnesotans really care about. Now, you said recently uh, to Minnesota Public Radio that you plan to hold Democrats accountable for campaign promises that you believe will be difficult for them to keep. What promises are those? Well, I think I've already seen some of the, the things that they're saying change from the campaign trail. Out on the campaign trail, they said they're going to lower health care costs. They're going to give Minnesotans more choice. They're going to lower taxes, even some of them said. Um, and now all of a sudden, they're talking about putting back in place the provider tax, which which frankly is a, is a direct increase of health care costs for every procedure in the state of Minnesota. Um, they're talking about raising taxes. The gas tax is a, you know, I, I always used to say that the most regressive taxes that you could put in place would be the cigarette tax and the gas tax. Um, the gas tax hits low-income people. You know, a rich person and a poor person drive pretty much the same amount, uh, right? Um, but they both would pay about the same amount in, in an increased gas tax. So it's a very regressive tax. Um, I think there are better ways to fund our road and bridge infrastructure. Um, in fact, one of the problems uh, that people say we need to raise the gas tax to pay for a road and bridge infrastructure, one of the problems that, that they say is creating that is that the, that revenue stream is uh, going down because vehicles are getting more efficient. So if the problem is uh, that that we're losing revenue from the gas tax, the solution isn't doubling down in the gas tax. Let's find a let's find a, 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 a revenue source that actually will grow in the future. And that's what we did with the auto parts sales tax. And there's still more money there uh, yet to be uh, dedicated if we want to do it. Do so it in your way. view, more focused dollars like the tax on car parts and car rentals as opposed to a gas tax? Well, I think what everybody wants, uh, first of all, it's, it's, I think, a great thing when everybody's talking about the fact that we need to invest more in our road and bridge infrastructure. I think that's a win, uh, regardless. Uh, now let's roll up our sleeves and talk about how do we do that. Um, we obviously have a surplus. Uh, we have more money. We're taking in more money than we need right now to operate state government. And I know there's going to be demands as we work through the next budget cycle. Everybody knows that. Um, but uh, I think we do have a, a difficult time explaining to Minnesotans at a time when we're collecting more money than we need, 
um, that we need to raise a tax to pay for something that is such a core function of our state government that it's literally defined in our Constitution. If you look in the Constitution, it's education, public safety, roads and bridges. I mean, it, you know, and, and, and how do you go out to voters and say, hey, you know, we already have a surplus, a, a, almost a record surplus, um, but to pay for this basic core function that, that you know, you expect us to do, um, we're going to raise your taxes. That's a tough. Uh, that's a tough sell to the public. So uh, those are the kinds of things that we're going to reminding be reminding voters of and 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 uh, constituents of as uh, Democrats move through this process uh, with now what seems to be an intent on raising taxes, which I think would be uh, really harmful in this uh, in this economy. Let's turn to the mute button. Speaker of the House designate Melissa Hortman has indicated that she will have the chamber mute button removed, something that the GOP had installed in 2015. And there was a hilarious video made for Minroast last year about that. But um, other states like Rhode Island, Ohio, California also have that ability to science, silence unruly lawmakers. What are your thoughts on the removal of that? And if you became speaker again, would you put it back in? You know, uh, it's all. This is something that obviously the the current minority and soon to be majority has tried to make a real issue out of. There's almost no chamber in the country where all mics are hot all the time, and that's what we had here in Minnesota. Um, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, the only time that we've ever had to use it has been to actually protect the rights of the minority um, when multiple members are trying to speak at one time, um, and and it's only used to try to restore. Uh, order to the chamber. Every member has a right to speak in the chamber. Uh, we don't take that right away from them. The, the button's not used to stop people from speaking. It's used from stopping other people from speaking over them. Um, and and you know, if she wants to take it out, that's fine. I think she's actually trying to make a a, a political issue out of this when um, she's the speaker. She can just not use the button, right? She doesn't need to go through all the hassle of having people uh, take it out and the expense of doing that. She's going to be the one presiding over the chamber. She can just not use it. Um, but the, ultimately, we're one of very few chambers in the country where mics are hot all the time. And it gets abused where members speak over the top of others. In fact, uh, she was actually one of the members that uh, was, was speaking over the top of others at the end of session here uh, four years ago. Um, and, and there's some pretty good video of that if people <laughs> want to look at why that button was put in. One last thing in our final moments, uh, considering that Governor-elect Walls is coming from the legislative branch to the executive branch, do you think that experience is going to help in the next session? You know, I think he is uh, an incredibly uh, articulate and talented individual. Uh, he obviously has legislative experience. I'm not sure how that translates to Minnesota because he doesn't have experience here in St. Paul. And believe me, Washington, D.C. and St. Paul are different. Uh, I look forward to working with him. Uh, some of the differences that I think might be a difficult adjustment for him, we actually have a constitutional requirement to have a balanced budget in the state. He's never had to work with a balanced budget before, uh, which is something that I wish Congress did have to work with, but they don't. Um, so, you know, I know he's been making a lot of promises to a lot of folks uh, since getting elected. Um, it's going to be difficult once he tries to put that all through the filter of a balanced budget here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, very difficult to keep all those promises. Um, unless, he wants to raise a whole lot of taxes, um, which might be what he does propose. But I think in this economy, uh, in order to show respect for the, the fact that we know where this revenue surplus has come from, and it has come very simply from the hard work uh, by Minnesotans who have rolled up their sleeves and, and built a thriving, growing economy here in the state of Minnesota, um, if we raise taxes on that now, uh, you will see uh, that, that economic growth decline and you will see uh, our surpluses uh, diminish. It's really simple here in the state of Minnesota. If we want the state budget to be successful and we want revenue to come in, um, our revenue comes from income tax and sales tax. All we need for this state to be successful is for Minnesotans to be successful. And one of the things that I would like to make sure that we represent in our public policy is uh, let's make sure that we pass things that help Minnesotans be successful. And if that happens, our state budget will, will be successful as well. Speaker Doubt, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you.
Governor-elect Tim Walz and Lieutenant Governor-elect Peggy Flanagan have begun filling leadership positions for state agencies. Jennifer Ho will lead the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, Margaret Anderson Kelleher the Department of Transportation, Nora Slawick will become chair of the Met Council, Alice Roberts Davis will head the Department of Administration, and Commissioner Myron Franz will continue to lead the Minnesota Management and Budget Office. The first round of appointments were announced at a state capitol press conference. We're asking these commissioners to provide the flexibility with their experience that they've already had about how we're going to create something new here. And this is going to take some time as we look across enterprise-wise. So I think, again, and I ask you all, because I know the questions will come up, this is five of 23. So this question may not be quite as pointed in the next group of five that come out, but I do think we certainly value that public service. I think there's something, as I've oftentimes said, um, I tend to, when I go to the doctor, to want to go to someone who's done medicine before. And one of the things is, one of the things is, if you're asking someone to have experience on leading, for example, the Department of Transportation, someone who's sat on that committee on the other side of it uh, for 10 years, like Commissioner. Anderson Kelleher has. You know, I think that the important thing to think about is it'll be a package of transportation yes. funding that's dedicated and sustainable. And the gas tax is an important part of the tools in the toolbox. It's still one of our bigger tools to call on. And I think it's going to take some work. It's important for Minnesotans to know that all of that funding is dedicated directly to their roads, whether it's their county roads or their state roads. And they can see the progress that we can make on bridges and roads when we have dedicated sustainable funding going forward. So it will be a challenge, but a challenge that I'm up for, and I'm excited to work with a number of the partners around the state, including legislators both sides of the aisle. Minnesotans spoke very loudly that they wanted us to do something on transportation. They heard me, again, the advice you get from consultants is, well, don't talk about raising taxes during a campaign. That's not the best thing to do. No, it's the honest thing to do, and it's the honest thing to talk about if, when asked, what are some possible uh, routes to go. So I think having someone with the holistic approach, as Commissioner uh, Anderson Kelleher has, is talking about how do we build that consensus like they did last time that was a very impressive feat, that it appeared like the opposition to the gas tax was was there because it was an ideological purity point. That proved not to be true for many legislators. It was about what was best for their district. Lawmakers from both sides gathered at the Capitol for an informational hearing on the soaring cost of insulin. Um, I called this round table here uh, today because I believe the cost of insulin is immorally high. Uh, between 2002 and 2013, the price of insulin tripled. And in the last four years, it's gone up another 16%. I always remind people that um, insulin is not a cure for diabetes. It is our life support. It is simply what keeps me and my younger brother and seven and a half million people in the United States alive. In Germany, um, this costs eight times less. If you go to Canada, just to the north of us, it costs about $50. If you go down to Mexico, it's about $45. Um, we know it's far less expensive in other countries around the world. In the United States, we at the time we were using insulin pens. It's a little bit different than Quinn's vial. Um, insulin pens are sold in boxes of five, and uh, we were using Novolog at the time. And a box of five insulin pens cost us $697 at the Walgreens at the corner of Lar Larpenter and Lexington. Um, when we were traveling, we purchased insulin in six different countries, and the price of insulin there varied between $40 and $73 for the same box of five pens. Alex's first visit to the pharmacy in June without insurance was scary. I can imagine how scary it was for Alec to leave that pharmacy without his life-saving insulin. And he left that day because he did not have the $1,300 that the pharmacist was charging him for, insure, for insulin and supplies. From the accounts of those closest to him, we put together a timeline that is as accurate as we can get without Alec here to give us the facts. On June 20th, the last day I saw my son, he stopped by the house with friends. They were heading to Wisconsin to buy fireworks, getting ready for the 4th of July. He visited with us. He paid me his car insurance. 
He looked well. There was no signs of stress or distress. He informed me that he would be picking up his meds in the next day or two. On June 22nd, Alec went to the pharmacy and left without his medications. We believe he felt he could stretch out his remaining insulin until his payday on June 30th. From his bank account records, I could see that he had approximately $1,000 in the bank on that day. So he was about $300 short. $300 could have saved his life. Something should never happen. And we shouldn't be having this meeting. And it really isn't even rocket science. You know, it's math and it's, and it's about greed, I think. And I'm, we went through the same kind of dialogue last year, Senator Eden and others, about the pharmaceutical companies and their lying about opioids, that they were useful and they weren't addictive and they didn't even come to the meetings. And here we are again with, I can't imagine a jury that would find them innocent of doing the wrong thing. We absolutely need emergency insulin on hand. I know uh, Representative-elect Mike Howard is working on this in the House already. Um, no one should have to die uh, because they're waiting for their paycheck. It's absurd. Um, so that is an immediate first step. Uh, secondly, we need, we need transparency. Um, uh, the way these uh, things get to the, cons the consumer, the patient, is absurd. We, you know, we've handed out um, the insulin fact sheet, and it's convoluted. You know, most products, they, they get made, sent to a distributor, and then you buy them at the store. That's not how this works. Um, so we need transparency in there. But transparency without teeth is, is not worth doing. Um, so lastly, we, we need to, to be aggressive this session, and we need to control the cost of insulin. And DFL lawmakers announced the formation of a new caucus which will focus on addressing the needs of Minnesotans of Asian Pacific descent. I'm honored to help lead our DFL caucus as assistant majority leader and it is also a great honor to be joined by many uh, new colleagues who will help bring a stronger voice to the issues among Minnesotans and all Minnesotans of Asian Pacific heritage. We have seen historic wins in Minnesota this year. One of many is the election of four new state representatives of Hmong descent. We came together to form this caucus as a marker of this historic win and to strengthen the values of the Posse Caucus, also known as the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus, and the DFO Caucus. I think many of us heard at the doors that in general, education, healthcare, economic justice, environmental justice, along with issues around language and, um, and economic opportunities, voting rights, those are all things that we um, have heard generally at the door. But what we're hoping to do with the MAP Caucus is to look at it from a lens, uh, an equity lens. We are a continuation of the immigration story here in America where uh, once the Olsons and Johnsons and Nelsons were all uh, new immigrants of this country, and uh, the fact that we all are here today speaks to um, the um, speak to this notion that uh, what President Donald Trump is saying is uh, untrue. We contribute to the community here. We belong here, and this is our country too. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.